And so, uh, anybody still have some shopping to do this week, particularly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, you know, I, I can say this. I'm a planner, but I'm married to an even greater planner, and so we are done. Have been so for about a couple of weeks at least. Man, I'm excited about this morning. I'm excited. Just uh, I had some time yesterday. Just uh, came up here, make sure I was good to go for this morning, and then. This was a just beautiful day yesterday. I hope you were out in it. And then just walking down the Embarcadero and really thinking and reflecting on uh, as we close out 2011. You know, this is our last Sunday morning service for 2011. So just really reflecting on, on what God had done. And for those of you that don't know our short, really brief history is that this church really didn't exist in its full form a year ago. We launched this church February 13th. And so just thinking about what God has done in the last 10 months, just blowing my mind that how this thing got started, people willing to be a part, the people serving, getting this space, uh, having to go to two services. I know you guys are here at the 11 o'clock crowd. You're the sacrificial committed ones, but there is a 930 crowd that comes out of convenience, all right? Uh, so there's two services that, that we do right now, and everybody's like, is he talking to me? Uh, no, we, we, we have two offerings for you, and man, keep bringing your friends, and we'll have to go with a third and a fourth, and we can do that now that we have our own space. And just reflecting on what the changed lives that we've seen in our faith community here and people from all over the globe, literally over 30 nations represented in our church just in 10 months, which is exciting to think about, man, could we really get every, someone from every country around the globe, all 195 countries? That's an exciting thought for me. And then thinking about this Hope Project, you guys have, uh, as Lindsay said, $12,700 just through two weeks. The offering goes through January, and so what I plan on doing this week, and I'm going to put a little bit of faith in you guys. Pastor wasn't a big enough visionary when he set the goal at 20000 so I'm going to put a little faith in you guys and tell you I'm going to spend this week really thinking through what would be wise for our church to do with our other mission initiatives once you guys blow out that $20,000 mark, all right? I know some of you are going, I was going to let everybody else get to twenty and then feel good about it as a church. No, you're going to do your part. You're going to receive a blessing from it, and God's going to use it to make an impact at a woman's place. Bessie Carmichael School, and then through our partnership with Compassion International with United Christian Center in Kampala, Uganda. Now, here's what's cool. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of backstory so you understand uh, where we've come from. Uh, two and a half weeks ago on a Wednesday, I was talking to Compassion International, and we were cementing our partnership with United Christian Center Church in Kampala, Uganda. And so they said, well, typically when we do this, we, you know, we'll send you some kids to sponsor. And we knew that was part of the deal and excited about that. And, and, but my initial thought was, well, we're giving 10000 right now. I don't want to put too much on our people, and so we'll do a sponsorship day in the spring. And he's like, well, you might have people that are interested now. I was like, all right, send them. So they overnight them to us. We get them here that Friday. Everybody was shocked Sunday. We were too. Uh, that we had them. And they sent us 38 kids to sponsor. And so you know how it is. You want to make sure that you're not a failure. So I said to them, what if I don't get all 38 sponsored? What if I just get 10 or 15 he was like, hey, there'll be an expiration date of January 27th. You just send us back the ones that don't get sponsored. I was like, all right, I think we'll be good for 10. Well, as of this morning, uh, there are only five of the 38 left to sponsor. Yeah, that's something. Because we're not just applauding the fact that our church has risen up. That's huge. But literally, men and women, families, individuals, friends in our church are going to specifically, for the individuals that you are sponsoring and I am sponsoring, we're going to put food on the table. We're going to prevent preventable diseases. We are going to educate them. We are going to make sure that this church we're partnering with gets a chance to share the gospel with these kids in ways that are relevant so that they might hear the good news and the message of Jesus Christ and respond by placing their faith in him. We've got five left. I don't want to see those kids tomorrow. Okay? Everybody clear? Everybody need, does the pastor need to unpackage this for anyone? There are five kids left. We have to January 27th, but I believe we can do it today. And so uh, that's the challenge laid out for you. If you've not been by the table, some of you have already done it. If you've taken a packet, make sure that you uh, fill your stuff out, and, and, and we'll send it in on your behalf. If you took one, prayed about it, and for whatever reason, God said, don't help out the compassion child, bring it back so somebody can, okay? We are 33 in. We need five more, and let's get these kids sponsored, and let's, uh, let's see if we can make a huge difference. If you weren't here last week, we announced that our trip to go see our kids and work with our church hand in hand June 11th through June 19th next year. Start set aside vacation dates, set aside your money, beg your parents, return all your Christmas gifts for cash. Whatever it is that you need to do to go with us, it's going to be a life-changing experience to know that you can sponsor a kid. And for those that can't make the trip, we'll be able to take gifts for you over to these children and, and, and video them and all kinds of things. So it's going to be 
It's going to be really amazing. Well, hey, one week till Christmas, we are closing out our Sunday mornings for the year. You'll hear more about this in a moment, but next Saturday, this coming Saturday, actually, Christmas Eve service. If you're in town, be here at 5 o'clock. It's going to be fun. We've never done anything like this. You can always say you are part of the very first one, whether it flops or succeeds, you will be a part of it, all right? And then you can tell us how to improve it for next year. Christmas carols, short talk from the pastor, 45-minute service, and, uh, and then we'll go out to, to, to wait on Santa, all right? Well, we are closing out the Proximity Sunday morning series, at least this morning. And two weeks ago, what we looked at, as we said, proximity, that, that God's come close to us, that God has come near. Two weeks ago, we said, why has God come near? And we really looked at just the, the reason why God came near, really, this whole Christmas idea. Last week, we talked about how God comes near and, and that he does so in a, an incredible way of humility. And this week, what I want to do is talk about who God comes near. And I think that you and I will find ourselves in the Christmas story, I hope at least, this morning. In all kinds of areas of our lives, we are a part of things that we, and from those things we understand what certain criteria are, what the benchmarks are, and it lets us know where we stand, right? Like when you go to the DMV, does anybody know how many questions you can miss and still get a driver's license? Six. <laughs> six. You can miss six. Anybody besides the pastor miss six? <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Come on, come on. A scientist missed six. The pastor's okay. Everything's all right. Uh, and don't raise your hand if you miss more than six, all right? We always wonder why that guy is always driven by his wife. Well, you know why now. Uh, he, he missed it. Uh, and so all of things like this. So when you were getting ready to go to college or university and you wanted a scholarship, you could go onto the website, right, and find a specific university, find out what the criteria was or what the benchmark was, and thereby you would know if you were in, right? What's the SAT score needed? What's the GPA needed? How many in-state residents do they take? And then from that, looking at your own look at your own data, you could pretty much deduce whether or not you were likely to get a scholarship, right? Same thing happens with the companies and organizations that we work for. When it comes to promotions, you have a friend that gets promoted, and so you pull them aside and like, hey, I just started at the company, but can you tell me what does it take to get a promotion? And then you begin to ask a few more of your coworkers and colleagues, and you begin to find out, well, you need to be here about two years and hit these performance marks, and it lets you know if you're in or out. Going into 2012, our church staff had some pretty audacious goals. And so we will be able to know at the end of 2012, and not all of them are measurable, many are measurable, we'll be able to know, did we meet the criteria or did we, did we not meet it? Right? When you want to go out with someone new, you can look at who they've dated in the past and understand where you stand, right? And you, you can do it in two positive ways and one negative way. So let's go for the two positives. <laughs> two positives are you can go, man, she dated jerks like that. Certainly I'm better than them. She's likely to go out with me. Or you could go, I'm just like the jerk she's dated. So she's likely to go out with me. Or you can go, wow, mm, everybody else she's ever said yes to was six foot five and had big muscles and... Uh, yeah. Uh, and so people, you understand in all realms of life, there's criteria, there's benchmarks, and you can know, you can evaluate, do you make the cut? Do you measure up? Are you in or are you out? And what I want to propose to you this morning out of Luke chapter 2 is that the Christmas story, the very first one that lands, lets us know what the criteria is for who God accepts, who God's okay with, who God is for. And so I want us to turn there. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll give you a Bible. We'll put one in your hands this morning. I think it's Luke. I think it's page 545. If you get a gift Bible, keep your hands up though. This is just our gift to you. The message, the, the text will be on the screen. The text will also, if you have a, a smartphone with a copy of the Bible or something like that, uh, you can find it there. Luke chapter two. Someone check me out. I think it's page 545, but uh, call me out if that's right or wrong. Anybody confirm that? Which page? 556, five, sorry. All right, 556. Five, hey, stand up as, as we read this together. This will be somewhat of a lengthy passage, and yet at the same time, I think it's a story that flows pretty smoothly. If you get bored along the way, I don't know, pray that God will make you feel bad about it or something. All right. We left off with verse 7 last week, really looking at Jesus, how he came, what the style was of humility, and what I want to do this morning is to help you understand the setting. It's the same day that Jesus was born. It's in the same area where Jesus was born. Here we go, 8 through 20. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. 
And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all they had seen and had heard and seen as it had been told them. You may be seated. I pray that God would use his word and just direct our hearts to understand some things regarding really the criteria uh, for who God comes to and who, who God is willing to show up for and who God's for and who God accepts and who God forgives and who God allows to know him. And all of those things, I, want, I really want us to look at that. So it's a night that's really starting out just like any other night for the shepherds, right? They're just doing their thing. They've got the graveyard shift. Anybody ever work graveyard? Like all night shift. Awesome. It's beautiful, isn't it? Not at all. All right. And so, uh, and so they're, they're doing that. They're doing what they would do every night. Probably one of them stays awake while a couple others of them doze off, depending on how many they're watching. And, and, and so it's just a night. It's just, they're, just keeping, they're, they're making sure because some of the animals are going to be sacrificed, so they need to make sure that they don't get taken away. They need to make sure that they keep the animals clean so that the sacrifice will be appropriate whenever that day comes. Uh, for the particular sheep to, to be sacrificed. And, and so, so they're just doing their thing, and then an angel shows up, and the angel says what the angel always says, right? Fear not. Fear not. Uh, that's necessary to say. But have you ever been in situations where it doesn't matter uh, the words people use, your emotions don't change? <laughs> they're like, fear not. Like, okay. You know, like, like if your kids are like, hey, Dad, don't get mad at me. Stay calm. <laughs> but... And that, that's kind of what, what they do. And, and I can only imagine that God's directed this specific angel. And he's, given, he's let the angel in on this great news. And, 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 and you know, it, it, it's this angel and all the other angels, this is the one, this is the job they want, right? Do you ever get a project that comes up in your company and you're like, that's, I want that one, right? And so you're buying your boss Christmas gifts in May and it doesn't matter. Like, you just, like, please give me this one. You have to imagine that that particular angel and all the other angels, when they knew that there was an assignment being handed out, they had to want that assignment. How many of you, and, and, and it, it came time for God to say, uh, all right, it's time to go tell these shepherds. It's, it's time to deliver the news. And, and these shepherds were the first ones that really get told that the event has happened. They're the very first ones the Bible records that understand the event has happened. How many of you besides me in the room are terrible at sitting on good news? Anybody else? The other 96% of you are liars, right? <laughs> Are, are just unexcitable people. Like, uh, do, do, do. I mean, listen, when there's good news to tell, I'm eager. I want to tell it. Like when my staff, when I can, you know, uh, when I can give them like a 0.01% raise, I want to I wanna bring them, pull them aside and go, hey, listen to this. Or I'll, I'll like with, with Tim, when I was able to deliver good news to him and Chris, I was like, hey, I don't want to just tell you. Let's go tell Kristen we're taking her to coffee and, and able to tell them some good news or other parts of the staff or with our kids especially to be able to say, hey, guys, listen to what we're getting ready to do. And, and, uh, and, and then like Friday, our, our staff decided that the, the lady that you may see a lot when you come into the building, her name is Glenda, and she's our security guard here in, in the building. And She's a single mom, lives in Pittsburgh, in East Bay, not Pennsylvania. That would be a really long commute. But it's a long enough commute for her, really. really. And so she makes breakfast maybe between 4.30 and 5 at her home. Her kids won't be up for a while, so she won't, she won't see her kids, two boys, two girls. And, uh, and then she hops on the uh, two buses, and then she hops on the BART, and then walks to, to this building. And so we wanted to see how could we bless her. And so it's really cool. The staff, we went shopping for her. Uh, Tim and I were only allowed to pick out the kicks. Like, we were only allowed to pick out the tennis shoes, and, and, and the girls chose everything else. But I've got to be honest, Tim was constantly questioning the girls and their choice of wardrobe for, for, for the girls that we bought for, uh, as if he knew better or something. Uh, but this past Friday, we, as a staff, we drove out to, to Pittsburgh, and, and we were able to deliver those. And I just wanted, like, not for selfish reasons, I don't think, I just, I would love to be able to see video of the kids opening the gifts. I mean, we hooked them up. They are going to have a great Christmas, and I, I just love sharing good news, and 
And so some of you are like, well, you know, people ask me all the time, well, Ben, did you guys find out what gender your kids were going to be? Did we find out? Yeah, I can't. I don't like surprises. Tell this boy. Tell him quick and let him tell it quick, all right? Some of you are like, man, I'm thinking of all the sins I've confessed to the pastor and wondering who knows. No, listen, with bad news, I don't, I, don't, I don't get eager to share bad news as quickly, all right? So, but good news, I love to share. And so you have these angels. And, and then I'm sure that God specifically directed them to the shepherds. But part of my creative thinking is uh, maybe the shepherds were the only ones awake when they got the okay to give the news. Have you ever gotten good news in the middle of the night? And so you begin to think, how many of my friends are in Hawaii that are still awake? <laughs> Or how many are in China or London? Because you've got to tell someone. Um, have you ever used some unconventional ways to wake your spouse up when you get good news on an email in the middle of the night? But then you know you've got to confess to her that you were checking your email in the middle of the night, something you promised not to do. You ever had that moment? Right? And so it's, I'm like, I'm coughing. I'm like, Shauna, I just was woken out of my sleep. I saw a vision and this great thing is happening or, or whatever. Uh, because we love to share good news with people. And so when no one's awake, you're like, so the shepherds are like, oh, we're, you know, the shepherds are awake. Yeah, I got news to tell. And so the angel goes and tells him this. And he delivers this really incredible message. And you can see it on Charlie Brown Christmas as well. Uh, but he says that I bring you good news of uh, great joy that will be for all the people. And we hear that, it comes in one ear out the other. It's like, how do you make a Christmas message new? Well, I hope that we'll see some things this morning. And um, he says, it's, it's good news. It's the first word where, just to get a little bit deep for a second, the New Testament's written in Greek. It's the first time that the word euangelion shows up, which is the word that we translate gospel. So when we talk about the gospel of Jesus, we literally just mean the good news of Jesus Christ. If there's something good to announce, there's a good news, here it is, boom. And uh, it says it's good news, and then it's great it's great joy. So you're like, why is it good news and how does it lead to great joy? Well, the how is in the third part of this sentence, right? And really the most important part. Here's what the shepherds hear. Here's what you and I hear, but let's hear it in a new way. Good news, great joy for all the people, for all the people. Now, the reason the shepherds were able to understand this idea of all the people, because they knew that if this angel was visiting them on God's behalf, then who couldn't be included? See, the shepherds were considered untrustworthy people. And so it's real interesting when you think about Jesus later on in the Gospels taking on the title of shepherd. And we, we'll get into that another day. But it's real interesting. They were considered untrustworthy. But not only that, the big deal, and I really want to make this point so that you get the emphasis and the heartbeat of this message, is that the shepherds, because they constantly touched dead carcasses and because of the animals and they constantly were touching animals who would be considered unclean, the shepherds were considered ceremonially unclean. And if you were considered ceremonially unclean, guess what you never got to do when the Sabbath came? You never, got, you never got to worship in the temple. So I want you to think, this, this is how we're going to make, like, if you're waiting, what's the bomb, the drop of the message? It, it has, you have to understand this so that you get this next part. Hear this, the shepherds were ceremonially unclean. They were not allowed to go into God's house and worship. So they understood that the religion of their day had the criteria that we spoke of a second ago, Right? They understood what the criteria was, and they also understood that they didn't cut it. They didn't measure up. They didn't make the grade. They, they didn't have what it took to be in the religious system of their day. The criteria was there. They knew they didn't make it. They didn't measure up. They weren't allowed in because, because they, they dealt with the animals that were considered unclean or the dead carcasses. And so they knew, uh, and it was just a known thing. No one wanted to be a shepherd. You couldn't even worship in the temple if you were a shepherd. Understand that so that you get this next point. Now how incredible does it seem that God lets, besides Mary and Joseph, and of course Jesus in on what's just happened. Now he lets a lot of people in on the front end, right? But as far as after the event happens, isn't it incredible that God allows shepherds to be in on it? Really next in line after Mary and Joseph. I mean, Mary kind of had to know, right, that it happened. Right? I mean, there's no epidurals that day. I mean, and you're like, well, I'm sure Jesus came out, and, you know, it didn't hurt. Or, no, it, it did. It, he's human, right? It, 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 she's in pain. Mary, Joseph, and then obviously Jesus knows. And then the next people to find out that it's happened are the shepherds. Religion said they were out. God said they were in. Religion said they've got to clean themselves up. God said not so much. It's profound. But in this, I think there's two incredible things that happen. One is the verbal statement. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful verbal statement, but I really believe that the nonverbal statement God makes in this moment is even more powerful than the verbal statement. The verbal statement is this, good news, great joy, all people. Now imagine if the shepherds had heard that second hand from a really religious person. 
So pretend like the angel shows up to a religious person, tells them what's happened, says good news, great joy, all the people. Somehow, finally, it makes its way, you know, through the message, that, you know, t telling people, telling people. Finally, these shepherds hear, and they hear it, that it's for all the people. You would have to think, they would think, well, that sounds, man, almost too good to be true, because does all the people really include us? Hopefully it does. But that's not the most powerful statement. The most powerful statement is that, is that God shows up to them in a nonverbal way. Right? God shows up to them, letting them know. They don't have to wonder, are we included in the for all people? They don't have to, like a lot of people today, they're like, okay, God loves us. Yeah, but I don't know that I'm in that mix. I don't know that I'm in that. And, and look at what happens in verse 11. It says this huge news that in the city of David, a Savior has been born. That's a big deal, right? That would make the front page of CNN, hopefully, the Chronicle, hopefully it would be the front page. Hopefully you would change your Facebook status to this, all right? If, if, if this thing happened today, that would be a big, big, big deal. And while it's a huge deal, that's not the biggest piece of the puzzle in verse 11. You've got to understand the first part with that. So a Savior has been born. Big deal. That's huge. But how does it start? For unto, unto, unto you. What I'm not saying is that Jesus came for the shepherds alone. What I am saying is Jesus came for the shepherds. It got personal for them really, really fast. They didn't hear it secondhand that it would be good news, great joy for all the people. And God, and God didn't say, generally speaking, there's a Savior that's been born. God, through the voice of the angel, says this, for unto you... Unto you. This is not a far off distant God thing. This is not a general savior. This is for you. And not just for the shepherds, but for us. It's not just, it, it, okay, so a savior's been born. What does that mean to me? Well, you're not the total reason why he's been born, but you're certainly a reason he's been born. For unto you. Unto you. This is for you. This is a gift for you. And that makes a big difference to me. When you go, okay, the shepherds are hearing God say, this, this is for you. And you'll find the baby. And then it's crazy. So imagine if one angel freaks you out. Imagine what happens when the choir shows up. You see that in verse 13 and 14? Like there's a solo angel doing his thing. And then suddenly there was with that angel a multitude. That's more than two or three, okay? I mean, if we're asking, that's a lot. So now the choir is singing, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among whom he is pleased. And then you get to verse 15, and they say to each other, hey, let us go see this thing. And again, if you're eager like me, you, you, you want to find the quickest way to get from point A to point B if there's an exciting thing waiting on you, right? And then you're asking God to forgive you for all the red lights you're about to run. True? Like, all right, God, this is, I mean, this is the Christian thing I'm doing, so just look over the, you know, breaking the law and going against the government's authority and that whole thing. So, and it says in verse 16, it, it, it describes to us how they went. It says they went with, with haste. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph. They went with haste. That, that meaning there is literally exactly what you think it is. They went quickly. Now here's what it doesn't say. And I think this is such good news for the shepherds and God news to us. And it's for us this morning. It says they went with haste. But it doesn't say, imagine they're in the field. They're dirty. Their hands are dirty. Uh, they, they, are, they smell like what they're dealing with. And it doesn't say to us they went and watched before they went to see Jesus face to face for the first time. It doesn't say they went to clean themselves up. It doesn't say that they took off their nasty, stinky robe and put on a new, laundered, fresh one. This is huge news. They had to believe and understand that they didn't have to be clean for God to choose them. And they didn't have to clean themselves up for them to come to God just go. They just go. It's profound news for us this morning. And some of you are like, uh, I want to know what the criteria is for God. All of us have wondered this, right? What is God's criteria? Like, even if we read the Bible, we still go, well, what, what is it? What is it really? What do I have to do? Because some of us in the room, if I told you 15 things you could do and that would match God's criteria, you would be on it. In fact, you would take off out the door before I finish this talk because now you finally found the cure. You finally found what will do it for you. You would take off. And you would begin to pursue each one of those 15 steps. Because we're left wondering all the time, like, God, am I in or am I out? Have I done enough or am I still on the outside? Did I, did I have it and then did I lose it? I mean, how do I know, God, if I'm in? The shepherds give us this great insight. God comes to them. They don't clean themselves up. They've been invited. They're the first people that are invited. And it says to us, 
that they leave glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. God comes to those who aren't clean. Imagine if God had just come to the religious rock stars of the day. Imagine if he just came to the Pharisees who had the Old Testament memorized and as far as the outside went at least, they, they always did what they were supposed to do. Imagine if God had come to them and said, I'm here for you and people like you. What would we fill then? Oh, crap. I'm not like that. I'm, I'm, I am not like those guys. I have blown it. I have hated people in my heart. I, am, I can't even worship at the temple you glad he didn't just come for those people? Here's what Jesus said as an adult, Matthew 9, 13. Put it on the screen. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He says, the first part is, I desire mercy. I desire to be a merciful kind of God and not make you just keep working and working and working so that you can get to me. Then he says, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Do you know why Jesus didn't come to call the righteous? Because righteous people don't exist. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the Pharisees, they thought they were pretty righteous. Yeah, they did. They had it down on the outside. The reason Jesus didn't come for the righteous, because there are none who are righteous. The Bible says that every single person in this room, and it's ever been created, minus Jesus himself, we've all walked away from the God who created us to love him, and to live a holy life. Every one of us in this room has. And some of you are going, well, I don't have the big sins in my life. Okay. But every one of us have loved things instead of God. We've looked at things to do for us, what God alone can do for us. Every single person in this room has done that. And Jesus says, I, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Because here's the reason. So the righteous people don't exist. But here's the thing you've got to know, too. If you get this message this morning, and I want it to sink deep into our hearts, I want you to get, okay, wow, Christmas shows me that just like the shepherds were unclean, I can be included, too. I want you to get that message. But you can't get that message for you and believe that it doesn't exist for everyone else. You can't internalize that message and go, wow, shepherds were unclean, they couldn't even worship, and yet they were the first people to worship Jesus face to face, except for his parents, perhaps. It's got to change the way we view other people. And just because everyone doesn't have to be clean to come to Jesus, we know that not everyone gets in on this thing with God, right? But God's made it available. And the scriptures are really clear that by grace we can be saved through faith. God deposits grace. He gives us what, uh, what we don't deserve. He gives us more than we do deserve. And, and, and it says that he has come so that he might pay the price for our sins, put us back into right fellowship with God the Father. And here's what I want to say to us this morning. Don't let your assumptions cage your potential faith in God. Don't let the assumptions you bring to this thing cage. What I mean by that is, is to wall off your potential faith in God. So assumptions like, well, okay, he may love everyone else, but not me. Or he may have came for everyone else, but not me. Or Ben, you don't even know the junk that's in my past. You don't even know what I did last night. And what I'm not doing this morning is and I'm not saying, hey, we can come to God any way we choose. But I am saying we can come to God as we are. I'm not saying that when we place faith in Jesus that we just go out and live the life we want to because the Bible says that God deposits his Holy Spirit in those of us who place faith in Jesus. And God says that he's committed to making us into the person of Jesus, being like Jesus, molding us, shaping us, uh, uh, disciplining us when he has to. So it's not like, okay, come unclean, stay unclean. It's come unclean. Put your faith in the righteousness of Jesus. And then in Reality in practical ways allow him uh, to help you grow in your faith. Get around people that encourage you. Uh, help you begin to pray. Begin to get into the scriptures. Begin to reflect on who God is. Begin to change the way, not on your own, but through the power of his spirit that he deposits within you. Begin to change the kind of decisions that you're making. Some of you this morning are thinking this. Ben, you don't know how unlikely it would be for God to come into my life this Christmas. Like you know, the things I've done, and in fact, I don't even know that I believe. If, if I mean, if God showed up right here, I'm not sure I'd be convinced. Well, you're not the first people that would leave here unlikely that they had it came into this room, unlikely that they would meet God this morning. It's true for the shepherds. It's true for Mary and Joseph. She's like, uh, "How will this be? I'm a teenager and I'm a virgin." That's crazy. I mean, Mary had as much chance of being pregnant as I do this morning. <laughs> Seriously. Man, that might get on Facebook, right? <laughs> All 
our pastor either really hit the cheeseburger hard this week or <laughs> but this is the reality for all of us do you know how unlikely it is that I stand on the stage <clears throat> how many times that I just rebelled against God and my parents how I choose selfishness constantly still how I drop the ball when it comes to how I should be a father and a husband and pastor it's very unlikely for God to come to me and allow me to even to even sit where you're sitting this morning, much less to be up here. But sometimes I think for me and for you, we just need to go. Listen, God's criteria is not perfection. His criteria is not a clean slate of your past. His criteria is that you would just come to Him. His criteria is that we would place faith in Him, regardless of where we've been. In fact, one of the mantras we have here at Epic Church is that our past doesn't have to dictate our future. Some of you have bought into that lie, that because of your past, your future is forever scarred, and your future is forever determined for you. And we just want to say, because of the grace of Jesus and what God's done on our behalf through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we don't have to be who we were back then. Our past doesn't have to dictate our future. So what if it's unlikely? So what if you can't get your rational, reasonable mind around every facet of it? So what if he didn't need to come for you because of all the things that you've done and everything you've been a part of and even the things you've thought about him? This is his prerogative. He sets the score. He determines the criteria. And what it says in John chapter 1 is that to as many as would receive Jesus, I think it's John 1, 12, to as many as received him, he gave the rights to become the children, the sons and daughters of God. The question you really need to wrestle with this Christmas season and long past this Christmas is this. Like, will you come to him as you are? Will you allow him to make you something different? Some of us are so determined in the room. You do things every day that you feel like the pressure's on you. You've got to do this to make sure you're the best in your tech world or in the finance world or, or in the medical profession. We have people in this room that this is what we do for a living. I get it. I want to be the best myself. And so when we come to spiritual things, we naturally take the same approach. Like, I've got to, man, there's pressure. I've got to do enough so that he lets me in. And the reality is, is you'll never do enough. But the beauty is, Jesus has done it for you. Can you simply do this? Can you embrace it by faith? That he died in your behalf. He got your sin and the punishment of your sin. You got his righteousness. Incredible trade-off. Incredible trade-off. And now, we should, after seeing what he's revealed to us this morning... Just as the Mary treasured the things in her heart and the shepherds went away glorifying and praising God for what they had heard and what they had seen. They had heard about this one that made space for them and then they got to see this baby face to face and spend perhaps the rest of their own eternity worshiping him. That offers for you and I this morning. Let's pray. Before we end this year, I just want to give you a chance uh, always, and this is not a, uh, just an opportunity for this morning, the invitation is always open, just to place your faith in Jesus, to realize that he's come for you. He's come for you over and over again, and most, uh, m most predominantly in, in, the, in the, his life and his death and his resurrection, so that you don't have to be who you were. Uh, he's, he's qualified you. You don't have to up your religion score this morning. You don't have to uh, memorize the Bible, though that would be a great thing to hide God's word in your heart. You don't have to do those things to enter in, but you do have to place your faith in someone other than yourself. The angel said to him, good news, great joy that will be for all the people. And uh, that can include you this morning. So if that's you, I just want to, uh, this isn't a magical prayer, just offer up just a prayer that, that I think would be appropriate. Simply saying, hey God, I realize uh, just from the story this morning even that, that uh, just as the shepherds weren't clean, God, I, I am not clean either. God, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against other people, I've walked out on you, I've walked uh, the way that wasn't your way, and, and God, even though I did that, you sent Jesus to pay a price for my sins, and I, I received that forgiveness, and I placed my faith in you, God, will you make me what I can never make myself? In Jesus' name, amen, you can say that, or, or if you are a Christian this morning, sometimes we realize we came to Christ knowing we didn't have to clean ourselves up, and now we live life as though we have to produce that in ourselves, and you can't produce it in yourselves. You can't work harder or try harder. Um, the Bible says that it, it's God's grace working through us. It's God's spirit working in us. And, and we need to tap into more of God's presence. We need to abide in Christ this season and into the next year. 
And many of us are reflecting on this past year. Things went the way we wanted them to go. Things didn't go the way. And, and we're looking forward to 2012. And I just want you to know that, man, God is ready to do some things in our hearts. Will we allow him to? I'm going to ask God to do that. And, and then we'll, uh, we'll go on. God, I pray that for those that are going to place faith in you for the first time this morning. God, I pray that you would give them the, the courage. God, I pray you give them the insight. God, if anything I left unclear, God, would you clear it up? And uh, God, I thank you for what you've done in our church this year. God, there's so much on the horizon. I pray that we'd be the kind of church uh, that gets in on what you want. God, constantly rejecting status quo, pursuing the things that even seem impossible because we have a God who's the God of the impossible. And God, would you, uh, during this season, God, give us safety as we travel. God, restore things that we've lost maybe in family relationships or friend relationships. And God, bring us back together into the new year. Uh, to really celebrate who you are and what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.